Uh, my name is Wayne Moniz and I'm an author from Maui and uh, wanted to talk about the stories a little bit from my new book which is called Beyond the Reef Stories of Maui and the World and uh, what I'll do is I'll just give you an overall view of each of the stories and then we'll see if you'd like anything special I can read from any a particular story if not uh, I'll take, take some choices um, on the last book, uh, Under Maui Skies, I wrote about specific uh, stories from Maui. And uh, this time, uh, there's still stories from Maui, but Maui is an anchor in the story. And either the story begins with Maui, ends with Maui, or there's a hook in it that is somehow related to Maui. So I'll, I'll mention that as we go through. Uh, the first story that I wrote was I Walked with the Night Marchers. And everybody's curious about night marchers in Hawaii. And what I decided to do is kind of do a little dig, and I'm always curious as to how it came to be. Well, why are night marchers marching at night? So what I did is I started to do some research, and I found out that one of the reasons why night marchers uh, come are because they're going to fight a lost battle one more time. In other words, they lost the battle before, but they're going to come and try again. The spirits will come and try again. And in this story, a lost squadron uh, of Kalani Opu'u, who is from the big island of Hawaii, the chief, and Kamehameha the first, the great, is his subordinate, and they come to Maui to attack Maui. But of course, what happens is the chief of Maui, Kaikili, is, is very smart at this point, and in fact, the army is defeated because they hide themselves in the sands. So if you ever get to that Wailuku area, there's sand hills and mounds in there. They bury themselves in the sand, use reeds to stick out of the sand to breathe. And when the, the, the uh, battalions of uh, Kamehameha the Great and Kalaniopu came, they were surrounded by these people, rose up out of the sands and slaughtered all the people that were the soldiers that were in the middle. And uh, so this is uh, kind of what's happening in this particular story. So one of the reasons is the, the battle is being repeated and they're coming. They, they would come every night. I just wanted to uh, relay a little bit to you uh, something that was just recent. A friend of mine was coming back from Lahaina one night and he noticed just at about dusk and evening was just settling, there were a whole bunch of people by the side of the road looking up toward the mountains. And he got out of the car because he was curious. What are all these people standing there looking at? And the people said they had seen a line of, they said, night marchers. They could see torches going across the top of the hills, and they were really curious about it. So that, that made it a little bit relevant when I was writing the piece. So it's basically the battle and what ensues after that. I, I don't like to tell too much about ghost stories because it kind of kills it, but... The next one is called A Day, uh, uh, a Day at the Palace, A Night at the Opera. I had written a play about the monarchy uh, years ago about them as teenagers. And, you know, as teenagers, they have a lot of fun and they partied and they snuck things in and out and all that kind of business. And I, I wanted to show that the monarchy, I know they had very heavy times. It was... It was uh, uh, you know, facing the overthrow of the government, things like that. But they also had a good time. They were like the rest of us. They wanted to have a party and have a good time. So it takes place on a day in the life of Iolani Palace, and several things are happening. I'll just go through what's happening. It's all chaotic. Lilio Kalani is trying to write an opera, and a lot of people don't know that Lilio Kalani wrote an opera. We only found that out about 15 years ago when they did a handwriting analysis of a piece that they found among it. She labeled it Madame Orena had written it. So when they did the handwriting analysis, they found out that, that she had written this particular opera. So she's trying to write this opera. She's trying to get a, an idea of what the opera would be. She's waiting for the muses to come. Uh, David Kalakawa is going around the world on his trip, and his boat has been delayed, so he's sent back to the palace. Uh, uh, Miriam Like Like and Princess Pawahi Bishop are practicing for an opera that's in town for Pirates of Penzance that they're going to do. And, you know, they hadn't acted before or sang before in a show, so they're kind of all excited about getting it. So they're practicing on the piano at the palace. Um, the, uh, also, um, the telephone has just been given to Iolani Palace. 
And uh, it's like the old days. They didn't have rings, you know. The phone didn't ring. All of a sudden, you just heard a voice come from someplace, and like the kitchen or one of the, the music room. So every time the voice comes on, they kind of freak out a little bit because they hear this big, loud voice. So that's happening. And finally, there's a mongoose. The very first mongoose is on the loose in the palace because they're going to bring it to the sugar cane. They're, they're temp, uh, experimenting with the mongoose to take care of the rats in the sugar cane fields. So all this chaos is taking place. And at the end, everything is kind of settled. And it's Lulio Kalani sitting in the opera house. And she says, and the muse, Mohailani, came and sat by me. So she finally gets the idea of the opera. And it's going to be like in the, in the vein of uh, the Pirates of Penzance about the royalty, but a kind of a light piece rather than a heavy piece. So that gives you a little background on that. What year? What time are we Are we talking about uh, 1881? This is 1881. The third story is the fires of Pu'u'o Umi. And if you know a little bit of Hawaiian history, Umi was the greatest chief before Kamehameha the Great. He attempted to conquer the islands, but he, he couldn't do it. But anyway, his bones, his ivy are buried with Kamehameha or hidden with Kamehameha's bones. So they didn't want to put it down in Kealikakua because people were robbing the graves and making fish hooks out of bones. And so what they did is they hid the bones. And this is the story, though, about Father Damien. Father Damien, before he went to Molokai to Kalapapa, spent seven years in Puna on the big island, and then this story takes place in seven years at Kohala. And it was there that I believe that he was first moved by a leper. I couldn't find the smoking gun of an individual name, but the bishop was writing to the people in that area, uh, telling them that, uh, excuse me, Damien is writing to the bishop saying that there were lepers in the area. Now they went up into the hills because they had no compound where they could live. So they just went up to the hills and lived up in the utmost hills. So Damien could see these fires up in the hill. So he's of course curious and they say these are like the outcasts. You know, you don't go near them. You're going to get their disease. Well, you know, Damien being who he was went up the hill and there's three meetings with this particular leper on the hill. And then when he comes down one day, the next morning he looks up at the hill and the house on that hill that this little leper lived in is on fire. And of course the Maui hook on that is he's then called to St. Anthony on Maui and that's where the bishop asks, is there anybody that wants to go to Kalapapa? And I say, Damien raised his hand. So then he was committed to go and live among the lepers in Kalapapa. The Big L was about Maui's first bank robbery, 1938, the Bank of Hawaii. And this bank was so easy to rob because here was the building, here's the sidewalk, you could park your car, step in the door, rob the bank, and step out again and get out of town. These two lolos, if you know Hawaiian lolo, is pupule, a crazy in the head, when I first read the Maui News article, Bon, it was that small article, it said that they drew their mustaches on with pens. So I knew this was going to be a comedy from the, from the get-go. And these two guys decide they don't want to rob their Lahaina bank. They're from Lahaina because everybody will know them. You know how Maui is. Everybody knows everybody. They don't want to rob the Kahului branch because they have too much security there. And so they figure they're going to rob the Paia Bank. That'll be in and out. There's only two tellers in the bank. So anyway, they steal some uh, suits from a local mortuary because they don't want to look like Al Capone and, you know, Chicago gangsters. Black suits in 88-degree temperature. And they decide, and then draw on their mustaches, and then they're going to rob the bank. So uh, what I can do for you later, I'll, I'll quickly, maybe I'll read for you right now. This, I think you'll love this. It's, it's kind of fun on the actual robbing of the bank. And there's a little bit pigeon in here, so I hope you can interpret them. Okay? So here comes the two guys. The angels with no more wings passed the bank several times to scope out the situation. Paia was immobile, having been drugged drowsy by the flood of molasses in the air. The big sugar mill is up there. They decided to go up to the sugar mill, turn around, and pull curbside to the bank. One step off the sidewalk, and they'd be in the door, then quickly heading back to Lahaina. Having just arrived from the Philippines, Florentina Balabag had been on the job for only four days. 
It was her aptitude with numbers and not her blood relationship to the manager that got her the job. Her cousin, the manager and alternate teller Margarita Fusam, had gone to the outhouse in back several times that morning. She was in her eighth month. Luckily, she was in seclusion when the robbers stepped into the bank. So Tony stepped up to the cage. Good morning, sir, said Florentina in the regimented manner learned by cousin Margarita. Can I help you? Eyeing the terrain, Tony pushed a note across the counter toward Florentina. She picked it up and quizzically looked at it. The illiterate note read, This is a hole up, H-O-L-E. Give us all your money, M-U-N-Y. She put up her palms to either side and said, I do not know this one. Maybe I get Margarita. He go, no Margarita, he snarled at her like George Rath. Give money. Florentina was further perplexed, having never experienced American gangster movies, much less a holdup. Show her your gun, Rico. Audibly, uh, uh, she's, I mean, show us your gun, Rico, growled Tony. His bravado melting when Rico pulled the red water pistol out of his pocket <laughs> and the rice bag, the remaining contents of the latter splattering to the floor like a wedding exit. As she said, red gun in Filipino, Florentina's eyes bulged, finally having realized that they were banditos. She peered for Margarita out the back window, but the little sign of the door still read occupied. She had no choice but to give the cash to the two perspiring Mormons with fake mustaches. Rico stuffed the dollar bills in the rice bag and scurried out to the car. The Dangs expected a shootout like Cagney would face as they burst out the door, but only action they encountered was a perspiring stray mutt limping down the sidewalk. <laughs> Tony grabbed for the keys in his pocket, then uttered, Oh my God! He realized that he had left them on the counter. He dashed back in only to reshock an already woozy Florentina Balabag about to make a yelp for help toward Margarita. He snatched the keys, uttered a mangle, Thanks, eh? and retraced his footsteps out. The car was off and running as Margarita made it back from the toilet. The Ford raced down Baldwin Avenue toward the ocean. So that's how screwed up the bank robbery was. <laughs> I was talking to some people and I, I mentioned I was gonna write about this and this lady said, on the day of that robbery in 1938, the bank robbers came to his father, her father's house and asked if they could shower outside in the outdoor shower. <laughs> See, you, you perspire when you rob banks, so they, they, they took a shower, they changed their clothes, and then they headed back to Lahaina. Now, the story is called the Big L because if you've ever been to Lahaina, on the top of the mountain, there's a giant L. And it's the, for Lahaina Luna. It stands for the school that's there. And it's, uh, every year at graduation, the borders, they put basically gasoline around the Big L. They set it on fire, and then they have their ceremony. You can see it from miles around. So the two robbers go hide the money and under the big L because they're not too smart. They figure L stands for loot, so they'll know where they hid it. So, so they take it up to the mountain, they hide it there. And I just wanted to tell you that because I'm going to read the epilogue for you. And I usually tell the audience, you can do the dragnet epilogue. Dun, da, dun, dun, da, dun, da, dun. And I'll do it like the voice did. The Dang brothers were sentenced to 10 years in prison. A few months later, they escaped for several hours, were caught while eating saimin in Kalihi, and sentenced to another 10 years. The word got out a couple of years later, though, while preparing for the final night ceremony before graduation, a senior boarder at Lahaina Luna, while digging an outlying trench around the Big L that would later be set on fire, pulled up a rice bag containing $934.41. He declared it a good omen, a gift from David Malo. The money was used to create a bigger L on the mountain. <laughs> Twenty years later, in the 50s, the same Paia Bank was robbed again, this time by a policeman faced with mounting gambling IOUs. The residents of the island eventually learned who the culprit was, but kept it under wraps, more concerned that his beloved wife and children were now debt free. And I remember my mom and dad always talking about that. We all know where the policeman lives and, you know, they, the island was small, you just forget about it. That's a thing from the past, you know. Now they take it to prison on that one. So anyway, that's a little bit of the, from the Big L. Uh, 
let me just go quickly. We just got a couple more stories I'll tell you about, and then the next was the trail to Mana. And in the last book, uh, Under Maui Skies, this is what it looks like. And by the way, you guys can get this on Amazon. All the books are there. So this is the previous. These are all Maui stories. I had a cowboy story. I sat down with some cowboys from Maui. They were like they had been 50 years on the up in Ulapalaku in the ranch. And at first, when I said I'm, I want to write a cowboy story, I said Maui's probably dry. You know, nobody robs banks or rustles cattle. You know, it's pretty low key. But he told me a great story about an opium smuggler that a cowboy had to trace. The background of the story is about Ikua Purdy, and many know about that in song and music. Ikua Purdy was the great cowboy. So in this book, I decided to tell that story because I was fascinated by it. And uh, in that one, there's two parts of the story. The first part is about their manager called Eben Lowe. He was, he was directing uh, cattle down the mountain, and his arm got caught around at the wrist around the rope, and the cow went and ripped his wrist off of his hand. And Ikua Purdy, who was part of his crew, went by horseback at night 50 miles down the mountain to Honaka to get the surgeon, the only surgeon on that part of the island. And they were told to meet at Mana. And of course, we all know that Mana has two meanings, the power as well as the place. So it fit. The trail to Mana is, was the trail to power for those cowboys. So then when Eben Lowe lost his hand, shows what good can come out of a bed, he uh, took them to Cheyenne to compete in the National Rodeo. This is uh, uh, 1908. And the earthquake had just occurred in, at that time in San Francisco, just two years before that. And uh, I'll just read, it's a short piece, just to show you the connection to the Bay Area in this story. San Francisco was still under construction when Eben arrived by steamship in the city with his best riders, Ikua Purdy, Archie Kaawa, and his brother Jack. The great earthquake had occurred two years prior to the Hawaiian Cowboys' anticipated showdown in Cheyenne. But the city, still in rubble, could not deter the Hawaiian visitors who were awestruck by the special place, its magnificent bay, rolling hills, brisk air, and alternating sun and fog. Their week-long journey from Hawaii had exhausted the travelers, so they looked forward to a restful night before catching the train to Cheyenne the next day. They loaded their belongings <laughs> onto a wagon and headed up to the Opal Hotel on Van Ness. And by the way, that hotel is still on Van Ness. Because remember, Van Ness was the newer section of San Francisco after the earthquake that they built up. Needless to say, the boys hit the sack uh, for a nap, until awakened by nearby evening church bells. They shaved, slicked down their hair, tucked their bright long sleeved shirts into their washed blue jeans, and headed to John's Grill down on Ellis for, as Evan put it, a mighty Ono steak dinner. After their feast, they spilled onto streets, patted their satisfied opus, their big tummies, while sucking on toothpicks. The air was cool but tolerable as they reached and strolled down Van Ness to get a better view of Alcatraz looming in the bay. And so the next morning, <laughs> they pick up the boat from Oakland, I mean the train from Oakland, and they travel all the way to Cheyenne. When they get to Cheyenne, all the newspapers are reading, beat the Browns, talk about real prejudice <coughs> on them that they were, they were the white color. But Evan tells them, <coughs> Evan tells them, don't just ignore them because tomorrow you're going to prove to them that the Hawaiians are the leaders in the cowboy world. <coughs> so that's what they do. Thank you. They go there. They go there. Um, <coughs> Ikua comes in first. Archie comes in second. And even Jack Lowe with his asthma comes in sixth. <coughs> and in the, in, the, in the songs that you hear, like Napalapalai's song, you hear about the Kela Kalapa, that he runs to the telegraph office and tells all the Hawaiian islands that we have the greatest cowboys in the world. So that's the story <coughs> on the trail to Mana. Um, excuse me. Then um, I wrote a piece called The Teenage Creature from the Black Lagoon. It's a comedy about 60s Hawaii when I was a young lad. And uh, it has to do, if you know Maui, the Maui County Fair is the oldest 
<coughs> fair in the state. It's almost 100 years old right now. It's getting close to 100 years. And uh, it's a story about the old days in Hawaii when it's a much simpler place. You know, tourism really starts to change Maui in about the 70s. But the 60s are still like the old days. So it's a nice, uh, just a nostalgic look at Maui before it went crazy. <laughs> For the Rose of the Chiefs is the next uh, piece. Now, I didn't know too much of this. These Hawaiian historians came to me and said, Wayne, why don't you write about this? And they threw these stacks of documents, ships manifest. Nobody had written a complete story of Ha'alileo. Ha'alileo was sent by Kamehameha III <coughs> to go and get sovereignty for Hawaii. So he got on the boat with Richards, who was a missionary. <coughs> they were afraid prejudice was going to take place if the, if the Hawaiians went there alone, so the missionaries went with them to hold their hands. And they go back to Europe, and they get sovereignty from France and England, and they get it from the United States. It takes a little while to get it from the U.S., and then they come back with the sovereignty. Unfortunately, on the way over, Ha'alileo succumbs, and he dies. He dies on the ship just outside the Carolinas, but they have a coffin for him made out of lead and alcohol. They put his body in there <coughs> and they, because he wanted to go back to his homeland. And the homeland is the Rose of the Chiefs. Hawaii is the Rose of the Chiefs. And so he's put in this coffin, and then he's brought uh, all the way around the horn. Now, in those days, people, you know, they just knew that the ship was coming in kind of when it was coming in, but come in on this day. So the people all came down to the shoreline to meet Ha'alileo and greet him, and all excited that Hawaii finally had its sovereignty. Nobody could do anything. So he comes around, the people all on the shore, Kamehameha III is there, but then the boat pulls in, and of course, it's the dead Ha'alileo. Now, this is my personal opinion. I think if Hawaii ever had a saint, it was Ha'alileo. He was so even-tempered, he could get along with everybody, he served the mission, everything was for the chiefs, and just, I mean, just a wonderful person that when you get into his life, you know, and this is just a short story, but I'm sure somebody will get into a novel someday and, and cover his life. So that's for the Rose of the Chiefs. On the wings of bluebirds. <clears throat> when I was a kid, I would go to the Wailuku pool and the YMCA building was right next to it. And I saw names on there, Duke Kahanamoku and a lot of the great swimmers. So, you know, I... I kind of believe that Duke Hanamoku swam in our little pool in Wailuku. And so I called this old timer, and you might know Mr. Durego up from Wailuku, and he's about <coughs> 94 now. And I called him up, and he answered the phone, and he said, You know, I'm sleeping. And I said, Yeah, I woke you up. He, I said, Could have been the Pope calling you. You better be nice to me. And he says, I said, Tell me, did Duke Hanamoku ever swim at the Wailuku pool? And he says, Yes. And he swam with Buster Crab. Oh, that was it. I had the story. <laughs> Buster Crab and Duke Anavoka are coming to Maui to swim. So it's about a little bit about that. All the kids are going, you know, the, they have the limo in, in those days. The 38 limo comes up and these two celebrities come out. And then he gathers all the kids around and he tells two stories. I don't know if you know this, but... Duke Ahanamoku is a hero not because he won in the Olympics. And it's a good time to remind us while we're watching these guys. That's achievement, but it's not heroism. The heroism took place, he was in Redondo Beach, and he was making movies at that time. He, was, he, he had won that celebrity status from the Olympics, so he was doing some movies. And he, was, he had some girlfriends there, and his friends were at the beach, and a boat was coming into Redondo Beach, and the boat was hit by a rogue wave, and this whole boat turned over with 140 people on it. And he went, he got his surfboard, he had brought his surfboard that day, and he got his surfboard and he went out and he saved seven people that day. He brought them in and his friends had to run down the beach because they had left their surfboards in the beach house, ran back and they saved a couple of more people. And it's about him and his reaction, you know, he's, he's swimming up to people and some are going under and he's trying to save as many and he's frustrated that he wants to save everybody, but he can't, he just does as best as he can. And from that point on, then the surfboard becomes a major feature at the beaches. You know, then Santa Cruz picks it up. And by the way, he, he came to swim at the plunge. 
in Santa Cruz, that old area down at the end, that's the art gate now. That was a big swimming place. And if you go on the top floor of the plunge, you see all these big pictures of Kahanamoku and Hawaiian dancers and everything. Very, uh, very uh, close uh, community between that. And then, of course, the surfboard craze and Belzy and O'Neill and all of them come into that area with the, with the surf thing. So that's kind of a little bit of the seven stories and a little bit of the background on them. I did say uh, that I would, also in the back of the book, both books have kauna. Let me explain what kauna is. Kauna is Hawaiian poetry. It's metaphoric poetry. If, you, if you're familiar with the romantics like Keats and Shelley and Byron and all those great romantics, Hawaii was writing um, romantic poetry before the white man came. And, you know, sometimes, you know, these people say, oh, you know, they're, they're kind of a backward people and they were, you know, natives and, and all that kind of stuff. No, if you're writing metaphorical poetry, you're, you're pretty civilized. And this is how it would happen. And they didn't have, they only had oral language. They didn't write down on anything on Pepa. So they would memorize the poem in their head and then they would go up like to John and they would say, John, this poem is for you, and then they would say it out loud to the person. What a thrill that would be, especially if it's a love poem, you know? I think today you get arrested if you did that. You, went up to, <laughs> you know, I love you dearly, and please take them, you know? <laughs> but it was very intimate kind of thing. And so what happens is you're talking about a person, but it's a bay or a tree or a flower. A lot of Hawaiian songs are kauna, plenty, plenty. Kaylee Rochelle's, a lot of his stuff is kind of talking about his mother, but he's talking about the mountain or somebody, you know, a simple one. I call this the Howley Kauna, Edelweiss, you know, from Sound of Music. They're not talking about the flower, they're talking about his lover, you know, his girlfriend. So those are the Kaunas and, and pretty, uh, why I got interested in this, I had my students write Kaunas. I was teaching at Baldwin High School and I had them write Kaunas and they started winning all kinds of contests all over the state and I said, oh, I'm going to write that. I like winning prize too, you know. <laughs> it's very sophisticated, it made the students sound. I have, let me read one from the other book and then I'm going to do one for Pakello, who is my friend that just passed away. And uh, Auntie Nona is in this book. Uh, Auntie Nona Beamer. I traveled with Auntie Nona the two years before she died. That's Keola Beamer's mom, you know. And, oh, this was, I wish I had known that lady all my life. What a special person. So I wrote one for her in here. I'll do that second. The first one, the San Francisco Chronicle loved this poem, so, oh, it's not too bad, huh? <laughs> not too shabby for a Maui guy, you know. So this one is called A Child Lay. A Child Lay. Hey, Lay Kamali'i. A beloved one, fondled in the arms, carried on the back, arms around the neck like a lay, a lay never forgotten is the child. A summer lay, a winter lay, is the child. Steadfast like the pilali gum sticks to the kukui, inviting like the sea scent at Waiehu, sweet like the taro at Keanai. A lay that is never set aside is one's child. And the fathers would come from the lo'i or the fields, yeah, and they hug around here, and that's the lay. Because the flower lay going to fall apart and die, put them in the ground, put them on statue someplace, but the child lay always, always exists. This is for Aunt, it was Auntie, for, uh, Auntie Nona when she passed away. I wrote this counter and gave it to Keola in a nice frame and said, this is for my, my precious Auntie over here. She used to live, she was ill at that time. She used to live up the street from me in Wailuku. She had been to all the islands, but never on Maui. So she was living. And she would come by with her sister and stop the car, and she would see me. She'd go, I always say a little aloha when I pass by your house. Oh, get right to the heart, you know. So I knew it was going to be special. She was from the Big Island. You're going to hear some Big Island uh, places where she lived, and then later in Waimea with Keola, where he has his slacky thing up in Waimea. The Lehua of Hawaii Island, Kalehua o Hawaii Nui. The skies cried, its own precious flower was picked, separated from her branch. Pele loved the Ohia too late. She shook her stamen, anointing the forest with honeydew. She came from the lone lehua of Ka'ala, an attractive flower on the utmost branch. 
She came from a tree covered with birds, a tolerant, towering evergreen, thriving in the cloud forest, clinging along the ocean edge at Napo'opo'o, her reflection in a freshwater pond at Waimea. Those far from Hawaii inhale the lehua mixed with maile and hala, the precious lover of heaven now adorns the altar of Laka. Let the refrain be told, a soft hymn of the golden lehua of Hawaii name. And she did a children's book called The Golden Lehua, and the maile and the hala are the two sons, Keol and Kapono. So in the, in the kauna, even the maile represents, the, and the other le represents the two sons. So anyway, that's one. And uh, I'll do the kauna. There was some people from Waihei here, I wanted to do that one, but I'll do the kauna for Pakelo. Now I have here an audio book from Under Maui Skies, and Pakelo, the, the great slack key artist, did the, did the background for it, the slack key in the background. I went to see him, I had been emailing him and talking to him, and then finally I went to see him. He was in Lahaina, Camp Pakusa, and he was doing the Waldorf school, teaching them slack key. Well, when I got there, all the kids were in the ocean, and they left the master over there by the fire by himself. So I came from the back, and I gave him a big bear hug, and said, oh, thank you so much for helping me. And we talked about 20 minutes, then he had to go do a class, and I went, went to Honolulu. I'll tell you why I went there. Two days later, he passed away. And what was interesting, he was giving cues or clues to everybody that he was going to pass away. He called different people up. The first gig I did at the Bailey House in Wailuku, in the middle of the song that we were dedicating to him, a telephone call came from him. And Sheldon Brown stuck out the phone. Look, it's from Pakello. And then he answered, of course, no answer. But we went, ooh, 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 you know? And I thought he was the rooster going across the stage that was Pakello because he was so kolohe anyway, you know, trying to steal the spotlight. But anyway, so I wrote this one for him. And by the way, they had a big thing for him at the Maui Arts and Culture Center. It was full of people. And on the stage were like 12 slacky artists, Darlene Ahuna, Dennis Kamakahi, I mean, you name them. They were all on the stage to tribute, tribute to him. Kauakea Ohana, the white rains of Hana. He's a Hana boy, and he's buried right there. Now, you may not understand the places, but I hope you feel the emotion that I had for him. O land of Kaahumanu, of Pi'ilani, come climb the hill, Kawiki calls for one last time. Come listen to the rain on the Avapui Keo Keo on the white ginger. Drip rhythmically and create perfume for angels. The son of Kaeo Kulani pierces the banana leaf, not the sky, not with spear, but song. O humble rain, nature's baptism, you refresh anew. Come mix with the ehukai, the scent from the ocean, wafting from the bay. The malua lua will carry you to Kuhamoa. The strings in my heart slacken with your kindness. Echo the songs of ancestors. O Vanana Lua is the land. O Punahoa is the pond. O Kawiki is the hill. O Kauakea Ohana is the mele, is the song. The tears fall, the clouds weep, but tomorrow, Mali Ehana, tomorrow it will be nice in Hana. For Kai Hua Kel Akala will be clearly seen, the mountain behind Hana. Every time Aoku gather over Pu'uki'i, every time the clouds gather over this place in Hana, and drops strum its ni'u, its coconut leaves, when the drops hit, remember Ka'ua Kea Ohana, remember the white rain of Hana. So that was for uh, Pakele. Okay, I just wanted to tell you what I'm working on next, because there's always something waiting in the wings. Hawaiians in the American Civil War. Were there Hawaiians in the American Civil War? That's always the question. When I read it the first time, a small article that the descendants of Hawaiians in the Civil War were going to meet. And I was here on the mainland, so I couldn't make that meeting. But when I got back, I was so curious about that. I said, I didn't know Hawaiians were in the American Civil War. So I called these guys up. Uh, 
And I started asking, you know, research, talk story kind of stuff, because a lot of it is not in books. So I got an email later from this guy that said, Wayne, I'm doing the same thing except I'm going to make a documentary film on Hawaiians in the Civil War. So I sent him my books and he wrote back and said, oh, you're a good writer. You want to join us as part of the team? So I'm uh, working with him and Nanette Napoleon, if you guys know Hawaii guys, uh, Nappy Napoleon, the great surfers, that's their family. And we're working on this thing on Hawaiians, doing research on Hawaiians in the Civil War. So I, tried, I started tracing one life. He was an actual son of a princess of Hilo, the Ahupua of Hilo. And he went to the Civil He was caught back east when the war broke out. He ended up fighting in three of the main battles, and Tiedem, I think, one, the second bull run, and the third one, I forget, Sharpsburg, Sharpsburg. And then he was caught, and he was put in a, a concentration camp, a prisoner of war camp. He survived that, but when they put him in the, the, the transition camp to go back out, he fell to the disease. You know, a lot of people in the Civil War died from disease, not from gunshots. And he died from that, and he's buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery up in Massachusetts, where the family burial plot is. So he has a descendant in Hawaii, lives in Kailua, on Oahu, that I got to talk to, and they're in, they're in the high 80s, so they talk story about that. So that's what I'm going to be uh, working on next, and I think that's a great topic. Nobody's written at least a fiction about it, for sure, and even nonfiction. It's, it's scattered around. There's little pieces here and there, but somebody needs to just kind of bring it together, so that's the, kind of the question. Anybody got questions? You want to... Know what's in the other book? I can tell you a couple, just a just a little brief thing about that if you want to in the other book. You want to just go quickly through that? I still get voice, so I can do that, I think. So you kind of know what was in this one real quick, okay? Uh, I told you about Under Maui Skies. That's where the cowboy is trailing one opium smuggler from McKenna all the way up to Kula. Because all the Chinese people, you know, their opium pipes lived up in Kula, so they had to go up the mountain to take the, take the opium. Uh, the Cave of Whispering Spirits is about the last uh, eruption of Haleakalan. There's two stories in that that I kind of combine. One is the story of uh, uh, Kalua and Paya, who were lovers, and Pele came to their house. She comes, and they, they said, yeah, get this old lady out there. Pele comes like, looking like an old lady. You know, when the gods come to visit, they're around us, yeah? They're near us. And you know what we do? it? We crucify them or run them out of town. So Pele comes, and they're, they're saving their stuff for someday they're going to give to Pele, but she's there, and they don't realize it. They're mean to her. So when the volcano erupts, two flows run down, and it's called La Perouse Bay. Some people have been there before. And that forms the bay in there. It was a beautiful beach before. The lava goes down. One side is Kalua, who has turned into lava. On the other side is Paya, who's also turned into lava. So when you go to that bay someday, so you have a little background. Not going to be on beach. You can say, Kalua, and that's Paya over there on the right-hand side. The other story is a, a family who is having, raising chickens to give to Pele when she comes. And when she comes to her house, they go, Hey, this old lady, turn her away. Don't feed her. And of course, Bailey got mad. And she, the, the son and the father are down in the ocean collecting water. Water in the ocean? Fresh water bubbling from underneath. They would take these jugs down, these uh, logs like, put them against the water coming out at the bottom of the ocean and collect fresh water that way. Then put a cover on it, bring it up, and then they would take it up the hill for fresh water. Because they're in a McKenna area is very dry in there, really dry. So they're down there. The mother and daughter are at the house. The volcano erupts. The daughter and the mother start running down the hill. The lava comes, surrounds them. They cannot get out of there. The lava eventually develop, envelops them. And the pico, they call that where, you know, where your pico, where the life comes from. If you go there today, there's two lava. Uh, like poles standing there and one is mama and the other is the daughter in legend. Now the guys have run up the hill but they see that Pele has already destroyed everything. They race back down the hill and they're hitting by flaming pohaku falling down on top of them. So they decide they're going to run into the ocean but just before they get there the, the lava hits them and if you're a boater you go there you go out about 300 yards and down in the bay are also two poles. One is the father one is the son. So you know the legend of those two places. It's always reflected in a piece of the land, the legend. It's always some, like Iao Needle and stuff like that. 
The Cruel Sun is about Princess Nahiena Ena and Kawiki Oli Kamehameha III. Now, when I start this story, I make you fall in love with them. You know, like when you watch, go to a love movie and the boy and girl, you, you cheer for them. Yeah, go ahead, go get them. So that's what I do. But at the end, I tell you that they were brother and sister. So, you know, the, the sensitive ones, they go, ooh. But Hawaiian, in that time, this is the Kamehameha clan. They want to keep the, keep the blood going. So they intermarried. And of course, you know, that doesn't help sometimes. But in that case, they were the brother and the sister were the ones that were having the, the, the sexual relationship that they had. So it's about their particular story. And if you go to Maui, there's Princess Nahiena and the school is up there, and also Kamehameha the third school is up there. Aloha Sweetheart, I called it Aloha Oi e Kuipo. It's a gangster stuff in the 1930s in Maui, you know, with the gams and the, the gats. And, and I, I wrote it like a Dashiell Hammett kind of LA kind of detective kind of thing. But you know, no matter where you are, it's got the same kind of people. Like LA, they have the Santa Ana winds on Maui, and Hawaii, we get the Kona winds. And when the Kona winds blow, oh, that's when everybody gets pupuli. You know, people <laughs> shoot each other and, and do crazy things. So it's about that story. Auntie Becky's Tavern was an old drinking place on Maui and lasted until about the early 60s. It was the only place you could drink after 10 o'clock on Maui. So that's where all the, the drinkers met, you know, to have their drinks. And it, set, it takes place in the 1940s, in the outbreak of uh, World War II in Kihei, Kalama Park. An Island Beyond Hokulea, this was the challenge, science fiction Hawaiian story. But you know, it worked out to be one of the most beautiful stories I read. This, this guys from outer space are coming and they're looking for a wise person to take to their new planet. And they decide they're going to take one little old lady that lives in Kei one Hawaiian lady. and. You know, her life is finished, so she got nothing to lose. And she's just a sweet, it reminds me of all old aunties when I was writing it that I knew at one time. So sweet. And finally at the end she decides, I'm going to go. She's going to take the spirit of Aloha to a new planet. And it's the island beyond Hokulea. Up in there. And then this one got, uh, just in, somebody picked it up in an anthology recently on ghost stories. Luahine Pii, the climbing woman. Every island has white lady stories. No matter what island you've been, I saw on White Lady the other night. And so I was curious about the White Lady, white lady of Iao Valley. We have one up there, and people have seen her. And, you know, my, one of my friends up there, uh, the, the wife told me that, that her husband had seen it, but she says he drinks a lot. So it doesn't matter. And she said, it's probably one hippie living up there in the forest that is white. You know, that's the White Lady. So... Um, Anyway, so I started to look into this story. Where would this come from? It's not Pele. Pele is not the white lady. She dressed red anyway. So I started to dig into it, and I found in this book called Sights of Hawaii, it's, a, it's out of print, just a small little story about Luahine Pii, the climbing woman. And it's about this girl who was raised in Pakukalo, and she had, was laughing because they were over there scraping with the opihi shell. They call her voice opihi scraper. <laughs> but she was pretty, but she had this ugly voice, and everybody would make fun of her. So she falls in love with this guy from the big island, and he tells her, I love you for who you are, not for your voice. Everybody makes fun of you, but I love who you are. Then he goes back to the big island to take care of his grandmother, and while he's gone, all the little biddies, you know, they had biddies in Hawaiian days too. They all came over there and go, oh, pee scraper, you know that boy fooling around, he had one girlfriend, big island, you know, making trouble. And so she gets in a depression, and he's slow in coming back. And finally, one day after them taunting, she, she wants to end her life. And she goes up to Iao Valley all the way to the top. She climbs on the precipice, and she jumps off. Just because of all what these biddies do. They call it bullying nowadays, you know, and people do commit suicide with bullying. So she jumps off the cliff, and this is the story of the white lady. So when we see that white lady in Iyao, we know exactly who she is. She tells him, she tells when he tells, the boy tells her, you're a ghost. She goes, I'm not a ghost. I'm just waiting for my boyfriend to come back from Hilo and then we'll be together again. So, you know, that's kind of the background of a ghost story.